Hello, everyone. I am here. It is Irene Lyon. It is the 24th of February. It is the year 2022. And today is the special topic lecture for February of this year. And as we get people on and people find me, just a, a few notes of housekeeping and what we're going to talk about. I'm going to make sure all systems are a go here. Uh, let me know where you are in this globe of ours here on planet Earth. And um, just a quick, very quick, but very important time sensitive note before we get started with the topic today. Um, I feel like if you've been following me for a while, then um, this is old news to you. But for those that are new, because there might be brand new folks who have just found this channel and my work, right now in in the period of time we are in until the 6th of march of this year i have got enrollment open for smart body smart mind 2022 now if you have no idea what this is i will really encourage you maybe now open another browser um, or after this go to my site it's just my name irenelion.com Go to Smart Body, Smart Mind. It's under the Programs tab. This is a 12-week live session group online program designed to teach you world-class information, education around your nervous system, your autonomic nervous system, but also how to work with it yourself from a somatic, movement, visceral, sensory, environmental, emotional way. And there's way more than just what I've said, but it is a very robust program. It's really one of the kind, one of a kind in the world in that it is my creation and my training is vast. It's obviously I have two degrees in science. I'm going to talk a little bit about science today in this topic of the alchemy of healing trauma. Um, my background's in exercise science, biomedical science, and health science. I did research at one point and quickly left it because I didn't like it. Um, <clears throat> so that's for another day. Um, and then from that, I started into the mind-body worlds. Some would call them alternative therapies, but really they are the old therapies that just never had a name. Um, so working really intensely at the level of the neuroplastic level through the Feldenkrais method. And then branching out into working with trauma and the nervous system at the autonomic nervous system level via the work of Peter Levine, who is the founder of Somatic Experiencing. And then I studied extensively with another branch from Peter's work called Somatic Practice and working with um, developmental early traumas at the somatic level, the unconscious level, the cellular level, the visceral level. And so all of these levels, if you will, of my training are within smart body, smart mind. I stopped my private practice years ago. I, I don't even know when it's been at least five years and put all my energy within these programs because it was super clear to me that while one-on-one -on -one work is fabulous and I recommend it if it is something that you might need, us humans in this current time, in this world today, we need way more than one hour every other week with a therapist or maybe every week, or if you know, most of us can't do that once a month, a couple times a year, it is not enough. Right now in our world, there's a lot going on that we cannot control, at least from what I can tell. It is unpredictable, it is ever-changing, and dare I say, it's quite chaotic. And it can be trauma inducing. And what I've learned over the couple of years that have just passed and before that, when we have the knowledge of our autonomic nervous system within our repertoire, when we have that in us and we know how to work with it, we can be in very, very, very stressful situations, very sticky situations and really work with it so it serves us and it serves our healing. So um, I'm, I'm really landing and thinking on that right now. And I'm gonna read some stuff as we get started. I'm gonna look into the comments for a moment. Um, and 
just to finish that up, smart body, smart mind, almost lost my train of thought there. Um, it is open right now for registration. And so we only run this once a year. Um, if there's time today, I'll answer some questions around that, but I want to get into the topic that I want to talk about today, which is the alchemy of healing trauma. And um, just to note that if you do want to sign up and you know you're going to, or you're like this close, if you do by the end of today, my time, so I'm in Pacific time, North American time, if you, if you sign up today, we will gift you three of my online drop-in classes for March, April, and May of this year. And so in addition to your two, to, in addition to the membership and the program and all the things you get when you join Smart Body, Smart Mind, and you become a member for life, it's not just something you do for 12 weeks and then you're done. We have members that have been in there for some people. Um, it's hard to believe this, but 10 rounds. We've done this 10 times this year is the 11th time we've run this program. So if you do register for today, there's a bit of an early bird bonus where you get three of my online drop-in classes um, complimentary as part of your membership. So just make sure to check that out. Um, I'm gonna just move my screen so I'm not staring at myself and I'm seeing your comments. I think everything looks good here. Ah, oops. All right, I see some of our alum are here. Hey there to all the alum. Hello from Jean in Oxford, Chelsea in Connecticut, <clears throat> Rose from Texas, Linda from Australia. Um, Jean is saying this is your second round um, for Smart Body, Smart Mind. Hello, Andrea from Canada. Lucas West. Hello, hello. Gosh, I went to high school with a Lucas West, but you're probably not the same one. Hello, if that is you. Um, Selma, Oregon. Hello, hello from Germany. You already signed up for SPSM. Awesome. Hello, Gart um, from the Netherlands. Very good to see you. So as we get started, um, for some, this might be a review, but I wanted to talk about what I believe to know is alchemy, the alchemy of healing trauma. Now I'm going to read some definitions or one definition about alchemy. And then one thing I also found last night on Quora, which is kind of an online, um, I don't know how to define it, but it's a, a question and answer forum where people who are experts answer questions. And so, um, so I studied alchemy, not professionally, but just reading books back in my early 20s and mid 20s when I was in my research world in the academic world doing my master's of research. I read a lot of Einstein. I read a lot about the alchemists and we could say it was magic, but it's more than that. And I did that because I needed something to ground me in all of the numbers and to be honest a lot of the politics and backstabbing and things that i was starting to see that occur at the research level that creates what we call science just being honest and while i loved what i was studying and i loved the interventions that i was doing with my students and my subjects and i absolutely adore learning about the human system and the physiology obviously i'm I'm 46 now. I started studying the human body in 1992. I think that's way more than 20 years now. Um, I'm not good at basic math, but I really still love um, the human system. And I also love how the human system connects to the environment and how it connects to things in the environment that we might not be able to see. And I also love how it connects, how we, how our insides are just so incredible. And so as I was pondering this last night and thinking of some of the definitions of alchemy that are really basic, one of which is um, transmutation. So changing one thing to another. This is kind of happening all the time. Alchemy is occurring all the time in our human system. For instance, right now I'm in the midst of digesting a piece of toast that had a little bit of cheese on it that was toasted. I have some liquid here so that I keep my throat uh, well hydrated while I talk, talk, talk. 
before I brought these substances in, the digestive juices to produce digestion hadn't been released yet. Maybe as I smelled the toast and all those sorts of things. But the system is always creating something different, something new. We secrete these digestive juices. We secrete our insulin from our pancreas when the blood sugar goes up. Um, the joints, as you move them, it creates something called synovial fluid, which is like the, the, the oil of our joints so that things work properly. Um, our hair is, is constantly growing. Our skin is constantly um, repairing and regenerating. I mean, we could just go on and on and on of, of all the alchemy that is occurring right under our noses, literally, and behind our nose as we live. And in all the trainings I've been in and worked with students, it's very interesting when you work with individuals whom have never thought to consider that there is this insane complexity going on under their skin and on their skin, right? We have this biome on our skin that's just got all sorts of stuff on it. Um, and so there's something I think very magical and very important for me personally, and I know my students can attest to this, when we begin to really learn about our biology, about our physiology, about how our stress responses, so I'll keep it aligned with the topic today and my uh, suite of work, how our survival responses happen when we're under threat or stress and how healing these stored survival responses requires, I haven't seen anything that would say otherwise, but it requires us being connected to our internal physiology. Now, there are so many techniques, and the word right now is biohacks, for example. And I'd be curious to know for all of you here, where are you on this journey of learning about the alchemy of your nervous system? Are you brand new? Are you an old pro? Have you been doing lots of biohacking techniques, trying to quick fix the stored stress and trauma that, um, you know, that has been carrying in your system for not just your lifetime, but in utero, which is when we are within mom's womb, transgenerationally, which is of course what occurred to our family members, our ancestors. I believe in a soul, I do. Um, and so past life trauma, the more I hear stories, the more I connect with my members, the more I see that, that, that we carry things from far beyond what we can see and feel. I just know that from personal experience and working with people, and I'm not going to deny what I hear from my students, right? If they tell me this is what they're working with, I say, okay, perfect. How does that feel? But the commonality, the common denominator, if you will, with all of these things is our physiology. It is with us all the time. Of course, our brain is with us, but we also think often brain is mind and thoughts. Our mind can travel off and, and wander or we can dissociate and be blank and not think, but our biology, granted we're alive, is always working. So even when we're dissociated, catatonic, in hyper arousal, sitting here watching me, having a little water, having a good time, we're always in this alchemy. The oxygen is coming in traveling through the blood in the amazing ways that it does to drop off oxygen through all of our body, through all of our cells, cells. It picks up the waste products and then it releases it through our expiration, through our exhale as carbon dioxide, as waste products, as, as lactate if we're exercising. And so it's always occurring. And again, what I've seen through this work is that when we really understand the depth and the intricacy of our nervous system and all these pieces, we can heal a lot. We can create some serious healing alchemy energy. And one could say that I could stop this talk right now and say, that's all I really need to say because it's just sort of a truth, but I'm going to read some things. 
um, and I'm going to see who is here. And so let me know, um, again, if you're new, if you've been around for a while, if you've experienced this alchemy of healing trauma, I'd love to read your comment. Um, but again, I, I kind of just poo pooed the biohacks and the quick fixes. And I'm pretty confident in doing that these days because I've seen so many people, namely my students, whom try because they really want to be better like yesterday or last year. And so they're, I get it. We're desperately looking for that quick fix, that pill to pop so that all the pains and aches and traumas can go away. And I'm here to say, I get it. And when we can take a little time to become the alchemist of our own physiology and biology, but also how this physiology, biology, neurology, somatic, sensory motor vessel that we have, how it connects with the environment, very important distinction with my work, how it connects with the environment and how we respond to the environment when we can really sense this and be aware of it, we have a much bigger upper hand. All right. I'm going to have a little, little sip to drink here. Hello to some of my alum. Hey, Donnie. For those of you that haven't been following my YouTube channel, um, one of my good friends and a student in the course of SBSM, we just uh, had a chat on my YouTube channel about his journey. Um, so shout out to Donnie and his work with his clients and how he's infusing this nervous system alchemy into his coaching work and leadership work. So we can pop that up in the comments here. Um, Mel writes, I never really understood myself because of early childhood trauma until I learned about um, somatic experiencing, which is one of the things I practice and then found you. I'm walking this way for a year, half a year now. It's not easy, but it's worth it. A hundred percent. It's worth it. All right. So let's just, let's just play some fun here. I'm going to read one thing I got from um, <laughs> the internet. So one definition of, of uh, alchemy, which was in Britannica.com. And I'm not surprised by this answer or this definition is the only thing they had was pseudoscience. Alchemy is pseudoscience. I'm like, okay, I get it. Um, and I don't know the pure definition of pseudoscience, but typically people use that term pseudoscience when it, it is new, it's misunderstood, and it can't be measured in a very analytical, linear, Newtonian um, cause and effect way. The one thing I have known and learned through all of my training in the sciences is we think we know a lot about how the natural world works and how the human system works. And, and I think I have a pretty good idea, but I think there is also a lot more that we can't see that we still don't know how to measure because at least here on planet Earth, we don't have those tools. At least we don't know of them. And so um, I just wanted to put that one out there because it was fun. Um, and then the common way that people think of alchemy is the old alchemist, you know, with potions over their cauldrons and is turning what we would call base metals into gold. So metals like steel and, and silver, things that aren't deemed as beautiful, which I don't think is true. My wedding bands are all silver, um, but turning base metals into this prime uh, metal mineral, which is gold. And so it's making a transmutation. It's like um, the chrysalis into the butterfly, the, the egg becomes the turtle, however you want to see it. Um, the, the cells that divide and divide until you have a mammal, a living creature, um, plants that grow from seedlings. I mean, there's so many examples of how things transmute, how they change. Um, and then I'm going to read something that is a bit longer from this chorus site. So story time for a moment. Thank you for all your comments. Um, all right. So this is from a, a scientist and I didn't really look into him, but um, I, I liked what he said. So his name is Mark Smit. So he writes, science is a part of alchemy. Alchemy requires a desire to improve oneself, something which science is missing. Science only concentrates on the materialistic and measurable. 
That's usually true. There are some scientists whom are still studying quantum mechanics, the quantum field. Lynn McTaggart's work, while well, she's not a scientist, she's a journalist, a science reporter that reports on the more esoteric, what you would call the more pseudo. Um, but her book, The Field, if you want a wonderful book to dive a little deeper into more of these things that we can't see, I really recommend it. Um, she actually, in that book, led me to the research that showed that back in the day, we actually studied the impact of prayer. And I am not by any means a practicing Christian or of any religious faith, but I, I do believe that prayer works. Um, I'm not going to deny that the, the millions and billions of people that pray are doing it just for the sake of something to do. Um, but these studies that she reported showed that prayer and distant prayer actually works. It works. But then um, all this research was shut down. And I thought that was really sad and almost angering. And if you get into the work that I do, while we are not praying to a specific God necessarily, um, although if someone wants to, I'm not going to deny them that, we are putting our intention into our body. The work within smart body, smart mind. And if I was to work one-on-one -on -one with someone is very intentional. We are adding and giving juice and goodness to the body. We're letting it know that it's okay, that it can heal, that it can alchemize. And so when we look at some of these older um, accounts of the people studying this stuff and it's showing really strong results and then it kind of getting wiped off of Wiped, wiped out essentially, um, I think probably for fear for those who are in the more materialistic science sea worlds. Um, I just think that's not playing very nice. Uh, I'll, I'll be very careful with how I use my words there. Um, so the book, and Diana can pop it up, it's The Field by Lynn McTaggart, L-Y-N-N-E McTaggart. And she's done a few other books. Um, the Power of Eight is a wonderful book. Um, about the power of being in a group of eight people. Again, this is stuff that's been studied. Um, and then the other book I'm going to add, and then I'll get back to this quote. Um, if you've never watched, or sorry, not watched, read the book Travels by Michael Crichton. Crichton, Crichton. He was the, the gentleman who founded the Jurassic Park um, series. He wrote those. Those were books before they were movies. Andromeda Strain. Really, really, really good writings. He was a medical doctor before he became a playwright and a director and a movie movie guy. And the best chapter in any book I've ever written is the final chapter of the book Crap Travels. And in it, it's an entire account of his mm, dabblings in what would be called the esoteric in energy healing, in meditation, doing silent retreats, traveling, exploring, trying to figure out things that can't be understood. And it's a great chapter because he proves the point or poses the case. Something doesn't have to be studied and deemed true for it to not exist, right? For it to exist, like it can be there. And so the reason you're, some of you are like, why is she talking about this when she should be talking about healing the nervous system and trauma and all this stuff? The reason I'm talking about this is because um, what can happen when we work at this autonomic nervous system level and we work at the cellular level, it's very energetic, it's very electrical. And sometimes things that were deemed impossible to heal start to heal. Folks within my world who have been on medications, type one diabetics, people on thyroid medications, folks who have had severe autoimmune disorders, nervous system disorders, and they don't change overnight, but with slow, titrated learning and practice and belief and intentionality, the body starts to heal. It starts to rejuvenate and repair. So I, I pose this as a foundational um, element. It's, I'm being a little more philosophical today, but to say that, um, Sometimes we have to have a trust and a belief that something will work. And we know this through placebo research, um, visualization work in sports performance, that just by intending and feeling something, it can create an actual effect. All right. 
So I'm gonna go back to this. So he then writes, so the last thing I just said was, science only concentrates on the materialistic and measure measurable. Alchemy stands far above science. The will and intent are still way beyond science. So the will and intent, so intention, are still way beyond science. I would agree with that. See alchemy as a spiritual practice that incorporates science as a tool. The other aside I will say is that um, I have found, and my students might be able to attest to this, and please put it in a little comment if you have found this, when they become more biological, more biologically inclined, more neurologically inclined, more somatically inclined, when they start to connect to the world around them in a more cellular, biological, attentive way at that level, many people will say that they naturally start to feel more spiritual and not because they're going to church necessarily or reading um, a, a Bible or a Quran or, or whatever it might be. They're just getting more connected to the universe. And I think that's pretty cool. So then he writes, what is magic? What was once magic is now incorporated into materialism. Um, in terms of alchemy, it also encompasses magic. And he spells magic differently without a C, but with a K. I didn't have time to research the differences there, but I thought that was interesting. However, it has nothing to do with wands or sorcerers um, for all those um, Harry Potter fans. Um, the same can be said of Wicca magic, especially the white kind. And that is, um, again, Wicca I've not studied in, but it is a form of healing energy. It is, it is a very ancient tradition. Alchemal magic is simply understanding nature way beyond what modern science can fathom with its self-imposed limitations. I'm going to say something around that too. So when I was doing my research back in my 20s and late 20s, what drove me nuts about doing the scientific method is you had to make sure that you were going to plan everything that you were going to observe. This is how ludicrous this is. Because if you didn't plan it and have an uh, have a um, accepted methodology to measure the outcome, it was then considered anecdotal evidence and you could not publish it. The most significant thing that I saw change when I worked with my subjects in my research degree, uh, we were putting these very awesome older adults, 65 to 85, through intense strength training exercises. If you ever want to read my thesis, it's on my website under my bio. Um, and I talk a bit about, I talk a more about exercise in relationship to the nervous system in two videos that I've done. You can post them here too. One was a vlog, one was a special topic lecture. Um, the most powerful thing that changed in these humans through this exercise intervention was nothing that we were studying, although they got stronger and their muscle mass increased and they stayed healthy. It was their connection to the world. They mentally were more strong. They had more vitality in their ability to just be alive. You could just, it's like a light bulb switched on in these people. And of course, I know that these individuals were now doing something that was contributing to a cause. They were meeting new people. They were getting out of the house. They were learning a new skill. And because they were increasing their muscle strength and muscle mass, I know, and the research shows that that improves all levels of the physiology as well as the mental side of things and our connection to just goodness. But because we didn't plan to measure it, we couldn't report it. That drove me crazy. So I'm just going to say that um, this is very true. There are many self-imposed limitations with science. And if something comes out that's bad in something, a researcher can choose to not report it. It's just how it works. So more than 99% of existence cannot be measured by modern science. I would agree with this too. This is what Michael Crichton talks about in that book, Travels, in the final chapter that is titled Postscript. Such a good chapter. Um, 
um, science relies on fairly simple instruments and simple experiments. Again, very true. It does not use the power of the extremely complex human body. I'm going to say that again. It does not use the power of the extremely complex human body. It is solely concerned with the objective, which is actually a small portion of the subjective. It is primitive, in my opinion, this is his opinion, as a practic practicing scientist, yet it does help allege human suffering in its primitive way. So I agree with what this person is saying in that um, it still is helpful, right? Um, this also gives us medical procedures to help heart problems, um, removing things from the body that we don't want. All that is very scientific. Um, creating medicines that are helpful for all sorts of things. Um, engineering is science, right? Um, there's so much in science that is still good. So he then finally says, science is yet young. Alchemy stemmed from Egypt and possibly before. That makes it at least 5,000 years old. My sense is it's older than that. Modern science is just a baby. Give it time to catch up. Magic is all around you. Just pay attention and forget science. It is trivial. So, you know, I, I don't totally agree with that last part um, because there are some elements, you know, I want the science that creates the car that I drive to not explode when I get to a certain speed. For example, if that's engineering, but engineering is science. I like having electricity, again, science. So um, I wanted to read that and I know that took me a little time to get through but I read this in service of seeing healing trauma and helping you guys, if you're interested in this level of healing, to kind of do this 180 degree shift to see the healing trauma aspects as alchemy within our biology, within our neurophysiology. I'm going to read one more thing. And I'm going to share a story and I'm going to get into some questions. Today, I'm not going to go through all the steps of healing trauma. The reason why is there's so many other videos where I talk about um, what it takes to heal, um, how to release trauma. Um, we just did, uh, we just released an edited replay titled, um, How is Trauma Really Released? We like literally just last week. So we'll post that up there. So definitely um, check that out because that goes into more detail around how trauma is really released. I'll talk a little bit about it now. So this I wrote um, within a social media post the other day. And so I wrote, trauma has become a buzzword over the past couple of years. So true. Everyone wants to be a trauma specialist. And it makes sense because everyone's starting to see that stored survival stress AKA the fight, flight, and freeze responses are wreaking havoc within our own physiology, with how we connect with others, how we parent, how we see the world, how we either stay regulated or not regulated when we are in unpredictable circumstances. So yes, it's become a very big buzzword. Buzzword. I then write how myself and my colleagues see trauma, and I put that with quotes, how we define it is unique and has to do with what's happening inside of our body at all levels. And then here are some of the levels, cardiovascular, so our heart, hormonal, which of course, I think most people know what their hormones are, but things like estrogen, testosterone, um, insulin, the things that come out of our pituitary and hypothalamus that signal things to release, um, digestive hormones, all these things. Um, muscular, emotional, sensory motor. So our ability to move our body and sense accurately our space, relational, immunological, all of it, right? So trauma will impact this, this internal system of ours, this stored fight, flight, freeze energy. Now these distinctions are important because when it comes down to how one goes about healing this trauma, again, AKA fight, flight, freeze responses that are stored in the body, creating dysregulation, it's important to actually know what we're trying to heal. I'm gonna say that one more time. These distinctions are important because when it comes to how one goes about healing trauma, it's important to actually know what we are trying to heal. 
in some ways, it's not the trauma we are healing per se. It's underlying nervous system dysregulation that we want to address in service of healing the entire human system so that the traumas can be released, uncovered, integrated, and completed. So they're just, they're done. Throw the papers out the window, they're done. It's complex, but oh so worth working towards. So I wanted to read that because it simplifies what we're doing here. When folks come into my world in the online space, we're not doing an inventory of what is wrong with them. We're not asking anyone what their history is. We're not asking anyone what their traumas are. <clears throat> we're not asking them even what their ailments are. What we're asking them is to show up so that they can start to become apprentices, alchemists of their human physiology. Now, if they want to share their history, this is what happened to me. This is the illness I'm struggling with. This is the, these are the memories that I, I'm not sure are accurate, but I'm having them. If someone wants to share that, wonderful. We'll hear your story, we'll acknowledge it, but then we'll bring you back to the curriculum. We'll bring you back to the program. Everyone, no matter what it is that they have experienced, where they live, who they are, everyone goes through the same curriculum, the same content, the same learning. And I've been doing this enough to know that the curriculum and the content is pretty damn universal for humans and humans alike. And I'm thinking about um, two of my, they're good friends now, but I originally met them. One was through a podcast. One was, um, she was an SBSM student. And um, actually, Diana, you could probably find these because both Courtney Townley and Janet Raftus, they're both SBSM students. Like I said, good friends of mine. I've done a few interviews with Janet in the past, but both of them just released interviews with me where they're talking to me about the work and their relationship to the work. But when they were introducing the work to their audience, they have, you know, their own businesses online. They both had completely opposite stories to how the work helped them. So we'll see if we can find it. So yeah, Courtney T Townley, her site is grace and grit. Um, FYI, Diana. Oh, by the way, thank you, Diana. She's here in my world somewhere else, putting in the links as I mentioned things. So thank you. If you've ever emailed support, um, it might be Diana that writes back to you. So Courtney, Grace and Grit interview with me, her epiphany in learning about the nervous system. So not just learning about trauma, but learning about the nervous system and the whole spectrum of sensation that we might shut down or be too hyper aware of as a result of our dysregulation, she found that her default when things went wrong was to get angry, to get very, um, I actually have, I have what she wrote. She said, anger was my armor against disappointment. Anger was my armor against sadness, self-doubt and frustration. Anger was my armor against feeling any emotion that I deemed uncomfortable or inconvenient. It protected me a lot and it also cost me a lot. Enter the birth of my 12-year-old son or her son 12 years ago. Never in my life had I loved 10 pounds of human so much during one of the many late night feedings. I decided for his sake, my sake, for everyone's sake, I would have to learn about this anger of mine and why insisting, I insisted on wearing it so often. It was not a good look. So she was very clear that, you know, she's got this anger thing and that's her default. And sometimes it does take something like a little person that we have to be responsible. And thank God she had this epiphany because not many parents do. Um, but to go, I got to, I got to move this because she, I think probably knew intuitively if she doesn't, that's what he will learn. Um, so she had written, and I have permission to share this. She said, I worked with a therapist. I read millions of books. I scoured the internet on anything that might shed light on my relationship with anger. And then several years into the process, I bumped into Irene's work. Irene taught me about nervous system dysregulation and how trauma takes a million different forms 
And most importantly, I started practicing expanding my capacity to feel difficult emotions other than anger. And wouldn't you know it, I stopped wearing anger so often. So I share that because that's one example. And then the other example is from Janet Raftis, whom um, has went through SBSM. We have quite, a, we have, I think, two interviews with her. And she, I've um, talked to her about her work. She's a psychic medium, a Reiki master. Um, her and I have talked about past life trauma. Um, and hers was a little different in that she, I'm going to read this completely. She was the opposite. She didn't know how to express her anger properly. And it was through doing the visceral deep work that she uncovered. And she talks about this in our talk. So I'm able to say it openly. She realized that she still had so much trapped trauma within her system from abuse that she had um, survived many, many years prior. And she thought she had done a lot of work on it and she had but it was more emotional work. It was more cognitive work. And you might be going, wait a second, Irene, are you working with emotions? The answer is no, we're not necessarily working with the emotions. We're working with the physiology. And by working with the physiology, we start to access the sensations in the body, which then create the emotions that we interpret as anger, joy, um, sadness, disgust, surprise, the kind of key human and mammalian emotions. Um, so she was another great example of how two different people using the same curriculum, very two different outcomes. So they were alchemizing what their system needed to be more whole. You get that? Because at the end of the day, our systems, while they are intricate and unique, and we come from very individual backgrounds, different histories. The human system actually wants to be whole in all of emotionality, all of its physicality, its robustness, its vitality. But we all have such different situations because of our upbringings. I've used this example before, and I'll say it right now. Animals in the wild, mammals, let's just say, they are all raised pretty much exactly the same, whether they're on the North American continent, the European continent, the African continent, Australia, Asia, etc. Even the polar bears are raised similarly to the bears here and back over in Europe, you know, etc. They're nurtured, they're protected, they're, they're held in the way that those animals are held. They're never left alone. And if they are, it's usually for very rare circumstances or something has occurred to the mother. They're, the mother's maybe been sick or has been killed, right? But they nurture them the same way. They lick them. They let them suckle when they're hungry. They teach them how to live, how to hunt, all those things. When a human comes out into the world, they don't know what they're going to get necessarily. They may get something completely different in one household compared to another household right next door within the same culture, same socioeconomic status, totally different. And because of this difference, and it's because of our higher brains and all the things that humanity is, we have this situation where everyone is so different. And so that poses a problem because this typical medical system that we often go to when we have a trouble, will try to fix the symptom, the problem. And again, I'm gonna say, there's an actual symptom problem, like you've cut a finger off and you need to get it replaced, or you've had some kind of acute trauma that requires a fix, then yes, fix it. But these ailments, these chronic conditions that stem from this lack of really solid co-regulation growing up, safety, nurturing, food that's that work our system wants all those things create all the things that a human system needs um it's so varied right and so part of this work to go back to kind of this thesis this alchemy of healing trauma is to teach the system maybe what it never got in the first place so that it can have that alchemical qualities in terms of healing um, the other thing that makes humans a little trickier is because of our higher brain, and as far as I know, there's no other 
uh, living creature here on earth that has the level of intelligence that can create this stuff that we have, right? It's just, it hasn't happened um, as far as I know. And so because of that complexity, the way in which a human mammal, human being must be raised is even more delicate than the animals in the wild, just because of that. So I'm going to go into these comments here. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Thanks, uh, Diana, for posting those interviews. All right, I'm just going to read uh, some of the things that have come through. And if you have any questions, please, please ask. Um, I'd love to hear from you. So Donnie had written, uh, this is in relationship to spirit, spiritual practice. You say, that's been true for me. And we got, you guys remember I was saying that when we become more biological, we actually, I found people have become more spiritual just by default. Um, you said, I haven't been to church in about 14 years, neither have I. Um, and I feel more connected and interested in source and God and spirituality than I have ever felt before. Scriptures also come to be more. Um, so that's wonderful. Yeah. Very cool. And then your other comment here, Donnie, um, like go forth and tell no one. I understand that that why that can be important when you're healing and doing this type of work when others around you might not get it. Um, Mel writes, I feel more alive in the moment. My senses are better. I it feels like an awakening and that sounds and feels spiritual. Yeah, you know, I remember when I was in university, long time ago, this would have been like 1996. One of my favorite professors, this is in my undergraduate degree, she taught me, taught us nutrition, applied human nutrition, sports nutrition, and gerontology, out of all things, that's the study of aging. And she was in the midst of starting to study at a research lab that dealt with metabolic syndrome which is what occurs when a human system is no longer no longer metabolically fit. So um, being highly obese, diabetic, having uh, chronic hormonal issues, usually due to lifestyle, but we do know that an individual can get that way because of unhealed trauma, because their system just doesn't have the get up and go to do things. And so they become more morbid which means sick over the course of their life. But she said to, I remember she said, there are so many people who will die never having experienced real human life force energy and vitality. She might not have used life force. She definitely used the word vitality. And this awakening, if you will, of the body it is life force, it's spiritual, but it's also about vitality. Having that uh, in French, it would be vital, that's life force energy. Ilan, it's called vital ilan. It's just this exuberance of goodness that isn't just psychological, it's also biological. All right. Someone asked if Donnie could reference the scripture reference. My sense is what... What he's meaning, Lorinda, is just scripture that maybe he's learned in the past and it just is coming a bit more spontaneously. That's my sense. Um, uh, someone asks if I recommend the book Complex PTSD by Pete Walker. I am not familiar with that book, so I can't recommend it. Um, Carla asks, will these links be put below? And Yes. Everything I mentioned, um, we will put this in the show more, give us about 24, 36 hours to get them up, but yes. Um, Carla asks, Irene, please tell me how you present the information. Is it all reading or is it all videos? So my sense, Carla, is you are meaning um, the information in the courses that I teach. So if you haven't visited the information page for Smart Body, Smart Mind, please look, because there's, a, there's a, um, a syllabus and there's an FAQ section. But as a quick nutshell, it's a bit of everything. So there's reading, there's videos, and there's audio. The bulk of the practical, if not most of the practical, 
exercises. I call them neurosensory exercises. This is within my 21 day nervous system course, smart body, smart mind, but also when I do my drop in classes, I call this stuff neurosensory work. Um, it's audio, but within the courses, we also transcribe everything. So anything that is spoken, anything that is visual video, it's transcribed. And a lot of people prefer to read because it allows them to titrate the learning. So if you've never noticed this, when you read something, it slows it down. And that can be a way to titrate healing for, th for some who might not yet have the capacity to take in free flowing information and, and uh, instruction via, via voice. And when I'm doing the neurosensory exercises, I speak much slower than I'm, what I'm doing here now. It's much more um, paced. And I am putting my intention into my nervous system and I'm shifting gears to not be in more in this social engaged learning mode. It's much more practical teaching the skills mode the way you would teach anyone a new skill. So it's much slower. Hmm. Claire asks, have others experienced a false safety sense? You feel calm and relaxed, but when feeling closer, tension and tighten, I see. This is very common, Claire. I think I know what you're talking about. Basically, what a lot of folks don't realize when they do practices that aren't geared at this intentionality of the nervous system, fight, flight, freeze, working with the autonomic system and dysregulation, a lot of practices can calm us and manage us. We might call them coping strategies. But if they're not getting into the underlying dysregulation that is fight flighty or freezy, frantic or kind of dissociative and shut down, um, that stuff will eventually come up. And so what so often occurs is that there is this feeling, this sense that we've, we've done work where we're safe and regulated, but then we know that something hasn't quite quite landed because then we have something happen that maybe is stressful or it throws us off a little bit and we just spiral into some kind of triggered trauma response. Um, that being said, someone can be working with their dysregulation in a very good way within my courses, for example, and they reach capacity. I don't mean reach capacity. They reach a new capacity. So I'm going to use my hands here to describe this. So let's say their capacity was like this big, right? Like a little bit more than a tennis ball. And then they do a little bit of the work and it gets a bit bigger. And they're like, oh, I can feel the world more. I can notice my sensations. My anxiousness is a little shifted. Um, I'm able to think a bit more clearly. I can rest a bit more easily. So, and that's accurate. They've grown this capacity. But in this more capacity, there's more room now for other stuff to come up. <laughs> and so then what occurs is it's literally like a knock on the unconscious nervous system door saying, hello, hello, I see that you have more capacity. We're going to give you the next, we're going to deal you another card of your old traumas. And then a person sometimes thinks that they've done something wrong because then they might have a symptom, um, something that doesn't make sense. Maybe they have a nightmare. Maybe they have um, a mental thing that's just driving them nuts and they can't get their mind calm. But what it is, and these are just some examples, it's the system bubbling up the next layer of healing because they have that much more capacity. There's more of a space for that big energy to come in. In Peter Levine's work, we would be the, the technical term that he uses in his somatic experiencing work are energy wells. The well of energy is bigger, which means that now there's more space to feel the bigger energies. But what sometimes occurs, and now I'm going to go a little off of this, this comment that you made here, Claire, is that sometimes we'll start with this little tennis ball shape. And then we'll do something that is not 
focused on slow titrated capacity building and it's focused on let's try to get this stuff out as fast as f impossible because i'm going to get through this and i'm going to go to that 10-day retreat and i'm going to beat that thing with a bat and i'm going to scream and i'm going to jump in this cold bath to shock my system nothing against cold baths but for this purpose not so great I'm going to do all these things to kind of stimulate the trauma out of my system. And what happens is a person, this can happen, and it's happened to many of the students I know, they go from an energy well of here, they open up to like, I don't know, what would that be? A massive papaya. I've seen papayas that big in the Philippines. So much more capacity. They feel amazing. But then the energy is too big. And then it actually goes, and then it goes back to like, not the tennis ball, but like the size of a prune plum or a blueberry. And then the person goes, oh, Jesus, what just happened? I had this, I blew my energy well out to here or not so much energy well, the capacity, I got all this stuff out and maybe they did have a release. They they, they confronted their demons, their traumas, felt really good. But the physiology, so let's go back. At the very beginning of this talk, I talked about all the internal stuff, the juices, the, the blood vessels, how things release, all these things, right? There's a lot going on in this physiology that's dependent on this autonomic nervous system running the show correctly. I hope you follow where I'm going here, you guys. This is important. And so if you go from this size capacity, tennis ball, grapefruit, orange, to massive papaya in the Philippines, feel it. The system is like, in a sense, dilated. It's shocked into this bigness. But then there's too many changes. There's too much thing. It's too much. And so the system goes, nope, can't do that. Shuts down to that blueberry or that prune plum level. And this happens way too much in some of these areas where people are trying to fix themselves way too quickly. I get it. It's attractive. You don't want to carry this stuff in your metaphorical backpack anymore. You want it to be gone and you want to have the capacity bigger than a huge papaya, right? But you've got to go slowly through the process so that the system can alchemize so that it can integrate, not just at the emotional level, not just at the survival level, because yeah, maybe you got that survival stress out, but the digestive system didn't have time to equil to equil equilibrate the cardiovascular system and the blood vessels don't know what to do with this bigger energy well does that make sense the mind all of a sudden is so clear and there's so much creative juice this is how some people go crazy they're given so many downloads and it's too much that they can't handle and then they just drop it all so i'm just kind of going through a few examples here but this is why um, it's so important to go slow and take time and understand the ramifications of opening up certain parts of the system too fast because it's going to impact all those neurobiological systems within us. And I forgot to mention how we connect with the world. I've had emails, my support team have had emails, I've of course read them, where people have been in bed, not able to function after some of these intense retreat experiences. And that's exactly what's occurring. Now, this doesn't mean to say that someone who's already got a lot of capacity and has done a lot of work and knows how to say, I'm not doing that right now. I don't feel ready. They might have a wonderful time at one of these retreats. But so often we don't have that stop mechanism that says, no, not today. I see all the people doing that. The peer pressure factor is real in these, in these events, right? For someone to say no, that can be really big healing right there. So, okay. Going to go through some of these comments here. So 
So Carla says, I joined the 21 day nervous system tune up and I have not made it through the first day yet because it's, it is reading. I have no attention span to read half of a column of a newspaper. So Carla, what I would really suggest is to do the exercises, right? And to ask questions. So for all the 21 dayers here, know that you can ask questions within our forum. Um, that's there for you. You've paid for that uh, level of support. So, you know, really ask questions, go in and be like, what, what do you suggest if I can't read? Um, I would suggest doing the audio, listening, feeling, um, and growing the capacity at that audio level first. <clears throat> Mia writes, uh, complex, so I'm assuming you have complex PTSD, you say. You've done a lot of emotional work, talk therapy, journaling. You're in a good place, but nothing helps my out of control blood pressure that was triggered during my during my trauma. Where to start? Me, I think that maybe because I saw that just now, but I just went through that big piece about the energy wells and these capacity buildings and how that impacts the physiology. Everything I just said relates to your question. So your question is where to start start with my programs if you can join smart body smart mind this week today um, i would recommend it um, because there is a bonus right now if you don't know what i'm talking about um, go to smartbodysmartmind.com and this is sort of my signature program that step by step brings you through very slowly the capacity building because you're right emotional work and talk therapy can be great journaling can be great but it's not getting to this physiological level. Very, very important. Hmm. Light Grid Oracle says, I thought I did something wrong when I experienced what felt like dark energy surfacing. Thank you. That prepares me better. My mental health went wonky for a, a little bit and it has settled. I wanted to read that out because that's actually really important to understand. Whether we want to call it dark energy, I'm a big Star Wars fan. I'm a kid of the 70s, you know, the dark side. Um, some might say it's the evil energy. I mean, there's so many ways to describe that, but it's very important from at least from my line of work to be able to connect to the dark side of things. It's very important. That doesn't mean that we're going to get trapped in it, but we have to be comfortable and grow capacity to touch in it, especially when really scary, bad, maybe violent things have occurred to us or our ancestors or our parents or around us. Because what happens is if we don't have that resiliency and that robustness to deal with seeing things that are horrific, terrifying, horror, et cetera, we'll actually shut down and we'll close off a part of us. So again, it's about having this balance of having it all there and knowing how to experience it in the physiology. Super, super important. Yeah, right now, especially, I cannot, I cannot say how important it is to touch into that side of humanity. And it doesn't mean it's okay, but to acknowledge it and feel it and go, oh, there's some bad, bad stuff going on. I'm feeling that in myself. How do I work with this? Maybe it instigates need this anger. Maybe it instigates an energy. Maybe it instigates a grief or a sadness but we want to be able to face it, connect with it, know it's there, not let it overtake us and then move through there. Cause if we don't know it's there, it can sideswipe us without us even knowing it. And then we wonder why our system feels so weak and so drained. So um, yeah, wanted to mention that. Um, and mentions the more we have capacity, the more comes up, the more the body braces. How do you work with that? Um, this is what we teach. Uh, so 
we have to learn how to feel the bracing. What do we, what does the bracing mean? Again, within the program, the courses, we get into tension patterns, procedural memory, movement. Um, the bracing might mean an emotion. It might mean an action that has to happen. It could be something significant that, again, I can't say what it is because everyone is different. But again, that's where, again, this, if you will, alchemy or this algorithm of the work teaches one how to be with the sensations, the tensions, the movements, the behaviors that come up. How can somatic experiencing be used for social anxiety disorder? So um, I, to me, I see social anxiety disorder as, again, dysregulation of the nervous system. So it is the fight and the flight and the freeze having a party in our system. And it's telling us that the world is a dangerous place. That this, these people aren't, aren't, aren't safe. Um, but it also can be, and again, this is where this is complex, depending on a person's history, a lot of times it's from people being brought up in household situations where they have to change themselves depending on whether they're with that parent, that parent, that sibling, that aunt, that uncle, that school teacher. And so we are constantly exhausting ourselves, changing who we are to be in social situations. And then what starts to happen is the system is smart. It says, I don't want to be with anyone because it is exhausting. Now, we don't want to live like that, but a person will create that and wire that. It's not hardwired, but they'll wire it into their system because that's how they have to survive. And then fast forward to when we're in our 50s, 40s, whatever, 30s, 80s, and we're still managing the environment through our own physiology as opposed to our physiology just being our physiology and observing the environment, but not letting it impact us. This is what I said at the very, very beginning about the importance right now of us um, becoming more resilient and robust and regulated within our own nervous system so that we are not having the outside imprint on us. We're wanting to have the outside maybe inform us right? But not impact us to the point where we are not functional. The bonuses for um, the drop-in for today's special, Anique, will be um, end of day today. So it's 1 p.m. right now here Pacific time. So like for another, just under another 12 hours. Anne asks if we have to remember the trauma in order to heal. Absolutely not. This is a very important thing because if we were so young or if it was so heinous what was going on that we have blanked it out or we just weren't old enough to form cognitive emotional memories, it's going to be in our physiology. It's going to be in the body. It's going to be in the way in which our system braces, the patterns of our um physiology, I can't say it any, any differently, the, the, the muscular patterns, the way in which our blood pressure reacts, the way our immune system acts. Some people will, will literally create an immune system that is depressed and we could say autoimmune, immunity-based, because it's better for their system to be sick in a family that's sick than to be vibrant and healthy because you're not going to match with that sick family system that you're in. I know that seems really weird, but it's true. It's a way of a person fawning, which is a more advanced term within the survival world. It's not really a survival response. It's a behavioral way that someone might shift themselves to appease what's going on. And sometimes that fawning response can be um, translated into just being sick and malaise and weak and, and we could even dare say pathetic and just a punching bag, right? And it's easier to be that to, than to be the black sheep that's like, screw this family, I'm leaving, or you guys are all crazy. You know, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Usually kids in a family system that's very abusive and unwell will rarely 
work to that level of challenging the system to wake up and heal and get healthy. It's usually just because they don't know any different. Um, so no, that was my very long way of saying, no, you do not need to have memories. One thing that can happen though, is that our memories will start to come up as we um, work and heal. But like I said, with those energy wells, those capacity building examples I gave you, our system won't bring up, a well, a flashback can happen. And a flashback typically is defined as a memory that comes through and it's triggering and it re-traumatizes ourselves. But often, I'm sure there's some exceptions, often that's occurring because a person's trying to dive too deeply into their traumas and then it pops out. Sometimes it might not even be accurate or sometimes it is, but then the capacity is too small to deal with that big memory. And that's where the person gets re-traumatized. But when we slowly, 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 slowly build the capacity and the foundation internally, these memories start to come up and then something that might be way too much for one person because that person has built up the capacity like oh yeah i just had a memory of this and and it was it was hard it was intense i felt it but i stayed present i could orient to it i allowed my body to feel the tension patterns i went through what i had to do and i'm now through it and that memory is not triggering it's just a memory so it can be really fun, some of these things, when we start to get the um, capacity and the mastery on board. Deanna asks, how much success has your, <clears throat> excuse me, I need a bit more water. <clears throat> How much success has your program had in treating depersonalization specifically with adults who suffered from severe childhood neglect? I'd love your content, but worry you may not be able to help me. So the one thing I'll be honest with, Deanna, we don't ask people what their ailments are and what they're struggling with. Um, and at the end, we don't do an inventory. Um, but I do know that there are folks who have come in with what you're talking about, this depersonalization, derealization, um, incredible dissociation, um, severe, severe childhood neglect, severe physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, ritualistic abuse. I mean, everything I've seen within our membership for those who share their histories, the key and I, I understand the worry that this might not be able to help, but the key is going at your own pace and asking questions and using the material to your benefit. Um, and so again, with early trauma and this really intense neglect where in many ways we as a human don't even know that we exist, it can take a very slow piece by piece approach of reconnecting to self, reconnecting to the environment, bringing it all together, and then maybe having a break for a week or two. But the key with a lot of these deeper um, traumas that occur from this kind of neglect or any kind of neglect or abuse um, is the body is really important because the body has disconnected. The mind can't make sense of what's going on just as a child who is being completely neglected doesn't know what's going on all they know is something is really bad and then as that badness doesn't disappear the human system starts to shut down and so we want to bring it back online slowly and to use my example of capacity building even micro slow, if there's such a thing, so that little bits are added, little bits are added. So I hope that answers your question. Hmm. 
Yeah, Donnie writes, I used to bypass grief and anger and now they feel more just normal and like joy and ease. So I judge the emotional states less and move through them more easily and quickly. A hundred percent. I have a video from a while ago. Might just be a picture, <laughs> but I think it was said something like new emotions are neutral by design. Emotions are neutral by design. And I think we put so much focus on healing our emotions, but really the emotions kind of like our digestion and our immune system, when the terrain of the nervous system is healthy, when the body is healthy, when the physiology is regulated, the emotions just do what they're supposed to do. An animal in the wild isn't going to second guess whether or not they should growl at a predator that's about to try to get their cubs. They're not going to second guess it. It just comes out and it's accurate, right? Um, so that's the part that I, I feel humans have kind of overly focused on is the emotional trauma and how to fix the emotions when really when we get to these underlying elements of the nervous system, the emotions just start to kind of funnel in really nicely like a Tetris video game, right? It just... They just pop in. Ketsia writes, how do we work with the emptiness of childhood emotional neglect and have nurture stick when reparenting when it is a strange feeling you didn't experience? Okay, I think I get what you're asking. So yeah, for some of us, we never ever experienced what it was like to be like that cub being nurtured by mama bear. Never happened. We never got that co-regulation. And yet, isn't it amazing that the human system can still be here and alive with that lack? An animal in the wild that doesn't get that will not survive. And this, my friends, is where humans are really interesting and cool is we can rewire this because we have this higher brain. So part of it is getting back to that body. So much of the work in smart body, smart mind, and within my practical work is um, bringing our own touch to ourselves or imagining the touch, moving the body in a very gentle, nonviolent way with ease and intention, learning about the physiology, understanding why our system did what it did to stay safe. So all these pieces get put together into this kind of masterpiece of learning with the nervous system and healing with the nervous, healing the nervous system. Um, and so we could say that it is, a, it is a reparenting. Some people will use that term. I, I don't love it because sometimes the word parent has a negative connotation. It's not, it doesn't feel good um, for some to say that, but you're learning how to be human. You're human, you're authentic human, and you're doing it on your terms. That's the other interesting thing doing this as an adult is you're doing this on your terms now. And then you're also having to watch how the old stuff might creep up the old memories of how that neglect happened. And that's where we then have to learn to have empathy with the situation, know that that happened then, it was horrible, it was terrible, we might need to grieve what we did not get. Um, but we're literally building up the system and teaching it how to have capacity and stay contained and express um, these sensations, these emotions. Yes, one can definitely sign up for Smart Body, Smart Mind if they haven't done the 21-day tune-up. The 21-day nervous system tune-up is within, most of the content of that is within Smart Body, Smart Mind. Smart Body, Smart Mind came before the 21-day nervous system tune-up. So they're very similar, but they're not similar because one is much more basic and beginner, whereas Smart Body, Smart Mind is much more advanced. Yes, doesn't matter what time zone you're in. So the beauty of the online learning space is that everything is recorded and everything is uploaded onto our program site. 
So you can access the calls at any time. You can, of course, join them live. But yes, if you're in Australia, and we have many Australians, um, very few of them can make the calls live. Um, some do get up at 4 a.m., so I'll give them kudos. But um, some will just they know that they can't. Um, my training calls are not interactive. I'm teaching. I'm lecturing. Um, our Q&A calls are going to be curated this year, which means that you submit your questions ahead of time. And then we choose a selection of questions to be answered that will give a variety of answers for the entire membership. And then the program site, um, in the program site, we have got pages upon pages where you ask questions of the lessons, the trainings, and our moderation team, there's about 10 of us, um, everyone's from around the world. So we actually have two folks in Australia, we have people in America, obviously Canada, um, East Coast, West Coast, um, I don't think we have anyone in Euro time zone, um, but there's someone in there mid during the week, work week, three times a day and on the weekend twice a day. So we have a lot of coverage um, for answering your questions. All right. <clears throat> yes, if you've already signed up for Smart Body, Smart Mind, you will get the drop-in classes complimentary. All right, friends. I am going to um, wrap this up. As you know, this was dedicated to something a little different. I wanted to play and dabble with this concept of the alchemy of healing trauma. Um, if you came in late or mid when this is back on and it's the recording, go back and press play from the beginning. I did some reading, really wanting to give you a, a different perspective like it's different perspective of the work, at least that I'm doing, that my team and I do, it's not cause and effect necessarily. It's not a biohack. It's not a quick fix. I'm not giving you a list of the things to do when you feel anxiety. I'm not giving you a list of things to do when you have pain. It's not that. It's teaching you at a very deep level what your nervous system is, how it works, um, how the sensory aspects of you and the movement motor aspects, how they work. And then the apprenticeship, the practice goes deep into the visceral parts of the body, the orienting response of the body, our senses. Um, we are, we do work with some emotions, specifically anger and disgust, healthy aggression, um, mainly because these are the more, let's say, what's the word I'm looking for? They're more elusive and they're very elusive because we just don't talk about them. Anger is still considered by many people a negative emotion. That is technically, in my opinion, wrong. No emotions are negative. They are just an expression of what the system is trying to move out and through. Um, it would be negative if that created violence or harm, right? But we're working with some of the harder uh, sensory aspects and emotional aspects, and it's all done in a very titrated way. There's education. Like I said, there's calls. Um, but this alchemy is what I'm interested in. Um, I also shared a few stories, two stories of two of our students who went through the exact same program, had totally two different outcomes because they are different. But at the end, I'll bet you um, if we were to get those two individuals, I talked about Courtney and Janet together, if we were to all have a, a you know, we would all have the same capacity to feel Whereas if we were to come to get to have come together, say 20 years ago, we would all be very different. So that's the other interesting thing. And maybe I'll end on that is that, as I mentioned, humans are very unique because of this higher brain. We do have unique characteristics, creativity traits that just from what I can see, aren't the same uh, complexity within the animal kingdom in terms of our exuberance, our expression, our creativity, this higher brain that we still really have very little knowledge about. Um, but we have this biology, we have this physiology. 
And so when we get this aligned and healthy, when we heal the stored survival stress, we all kind of become the same, but we also become more individual and authentic in ourselves. And that, in my opinion, would be, if there is such a thing as human enlightenment, it would be that all humans have this regulation and this access to all of their biology, feeling everything, knowing how to respond to the environment, not storing stress. And when that occurs, we become who we're supposed to be. Imagine that. It would be pretty darn cool. So that's the goal in terms of alchemizing our trauma healing. Um, Thank you for being here. Thank you, Diana, for posting all these links. We'll get these up on the show more. Give us about 24 hours, 36 hours to do that. As I mentioned, Smart Body, Smart Mind is open right now until the 6th of March for registration. We do this once a year. We only open up registration once a year. We will not open up registration until 2023. Um, So now is the time to get in, to invest. There are different payment options. If you haven't gone to the course site, please go there. There is an entire FAQ page with 18 questions that has pretty much all the commonly asked questions we get. The syllabus is there. And then there's also many stories of our alumni. And when you read those stories or you listen to the videos, you will see that the healing responses are all completely different. And it's because each person starts at a different place. All right, everyone, you're welcome so much. My pleasure. Keep learning, keep healing, and just keep repeating that. And uh, we will see you soon, hopefully, maybe in Smart Body, Smart Mind. Um, And the one last thing I forgot to mention, I have drop-in class this Saturday. All that information is on my site, 12 o'clock Pacific, one hour. Um, We're going to talk and explore. It's practical, um, something called nervous system-informed breathing. So we're going to breathe, but we're not going to work for it. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you later. Bye for now.